Yes, the eternity is true. Got it. Awesome. Uh, we're having a Friday brown bag after after the summer. Isn't this great? <laughs> Plenty more scheduled. I promise the schedule will be up in just about very soon. I'd like to introduce Delaney Kerr and Selwyn Hemingway, who are on the um, the call 300 Geology 310 trip to Bahamas. Uh, in the audience is Rowan Lockwood, who. Uh, <laughs> along with myself and Chloe Obera, who are um, in, is in, in Hawaii right now, uh, li, uh, about to listen to this wonderful trip that we took um, in May. So here you go. Well, you stole my introduction, but <laughs> um, yes, we went to San Salvador and looked at the geology and the marine ecology of San Salvador, but we all know what we really care about, but <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, Okay, so we, nope, that's not gonna work. Okay, there we go. So we started by flying into Nassau um, and spent the night at this very luxurious hotel. I mean, she's, yeah. Um, and then the next morning we flew into San Salvador, which is over here. Um, here's a map to kind of orient you, which we'll be showing before each spot. Um, and we stayed up on the Northern end of the island at the Jurace Field Station um which used to be a navy base but has since been converted into a field station associated with the college of the bahamas um this is a little overhead view of it um and we're gonna kind of give you a picture of the living situation here um these were the dorms that we stayed in um here's the cafeteria over here with the little pavilion that we ate at every day and then over in this building we had a designated classroom um that was just ours for the week and we brought back a lot of specimens and everything. And we um, met every night after dinner to kind of talk about what we saw during the day. Here's some more pictures, um, the dorms over here again, um, and the pavilion where we ate all of our meals, well, except for box lunches. Um, and then inside of our dorms, which were not as luxurious as the hotel in Nassau, but we made it work. <laughs> and, Oh, and then this this is inside the cafeteria. Um, COVID was obviously still happening, so we grabbed our food and then came out to the uh, pavilion to eat food. So yeah, yeah. All right. So our first stop of the trip was Coburn Town Fossil Reef, which is right over there on that big red star. So this is a Pleistocene age reef, about a hundred thousand years old. And we wanted to compare this fossil reef to the modern reef that we visited later that day that Selwyn will tell you about shortly. So what you're looking at here is what we call karst, holy limestone that's very sharp. <laughs> and we have a whole bunch of fossil corals and marine mollusks in here. So you can kind of see that here. This is a big fossil victoria, and you can see it from probably the ending cross section here. Pretty cool. So overall at this reef, we see big corals, abundant corals, and diverse corals. So lots of different types of coral. And compared to the modern reef, we see a greater percentage of what we call reef building coral. So the big branching coral that creates the vertical structure, which is a good metric of reef health. So we concluded that there's greater organism density and better species richness here, creating an overall healthier reef. So then in the afternoon, we just um, went further south down to Snapshot Reef, um, which is pictured here. Um, we had to swim pretty far out. It was like less than a fourth of a mile, I think. Um, and we saw lots of these barrel sponges over here. I think there's a sea fan pictured here. Uh, we even saw a barracuda over here. Um, but this reef was very flat and very sparse and did not have a lot of diversity. Um, and so, like Delaney was talking about, um, the Pleistocene Reef um, that we were looking at in Coburn Town was a lot healthier than this one. Um, we even saw, we actually, well, we weren't intending on doing this, but we kind of stumbled across the drop off, um, the continental drop off over here, which you can see, um, and we'll talk about later on. Um, here's where we were getting our gear. We just kind of hopped over the wall from the, um, from the road. The highway. And yeah, <laughs> it was a time. Um, so this is a less healthy version of the Coburn Town Reef. 
So first off, the next day, we venture under the ground to Lighthouse Cave. So Lighthouse Cave is, of course, named for this little lighthouse that's about a 10-minute walk from the entrance to the cave. And uh, the entrance is kind of just a hole in the ground. So we, we hike through the woods and climb down this little ladder to get down there. You can kind of see what that was like. Um, so we wanted to figure out how this cave formed. Um, big answer to that is there's fresh water and salt water that mix together under the water. And this wave action from that mixing plus the acidity of the ocean water dissolve the limestone. We get a bunch of little chambers that eventually coalesce into one big chamber and then we get the cave. And of course, you can see that the cave is still invaded by water, which varies with the tides. So we had to be very careful about when we went into this cave. We didn't get stuck. Now, this is one of my personal favorite stops of the trip because you see mineralogical diversity here that you don't see in other parts of the island because the rest of it is all carbonate. <laughs> but down here, we have cave microbes, we have bats, and of course, that means there's bad guano down here. We actually saw them. Had to be very quiet going down so we could see them without scaring them away. And then, of course, there's minerals dissolved in the water. So all that together combines to make minerals like appetite, which we actually brought, brought a UV light down and we could see because it fluoresces yellow. So I was like hunting around on the wall <laughs> trying to find <laughs> all the appetite. You turn all the lights off. Too. We did, yes. There was a moment when we got into a chamber kind of deeper into the cave we all shut our lights out and we tried to be quiet for five seconds but it was it didn't really work yeah. out <laughs> we tried and the other thing that we saw here that was neat was there were some land snail fossils in the wall which tells us that this was originally terrestrial rock so later that afternoon um we went from over here past the drace um and then we went to sand dollar beach which is where we talked about beach rock um, which is really cool there uh, you can see the beach rock over here um, and that was at a lot of the beaches that we visited throughout the week and beach rock um, forms by um, the precipitation of calcium carbonate um, that actually cements the grains of the sand um, into rock and so it's kind of a direct reflection of the um, sand composition which is pretty cool and so we went out there with our hand lenses and our um, little sediment cards uh, grain size cards and we compared what we saw in the beach rock to the uh, sand gra grains and figured out from there how the uh, beach rock actually formed and then Danny gave her lovely presentation about <laughs> beach rock um, but here's part of the um, or a picture of what the sand grains actually looked like it was a lot of um, the eroded calcium platform and um, little bits of coral and shells and you can either see, you can see a foram right here um, and a little bit of um, the coralline algae that we were also seeing offshore. So that night, uh, we had an optional snorkel trip to Grand Harbor, um, which was pretty cool. We all had um, our little underwater flashlights. This is the only good photo from it. Um, shout out to Chloe for taking this. We went um, in hopes to see a lot of octopi, but we sadly, I don't think we saw any, um, but we saw a lot of squid and some really cool lobsters. Like you can see my drawings up here um, and some reef shrimp and trumpet fish and needle fish. It was really funny because we'd be swimming along and then we'd happen along like sleeping fish and then they'd get startled and freak out. Um, one of the needle fish jumped into Jenny's hair. Um, <laughs> we had to untangle it. <laughs> um, but then I also want to take this opportunity to talk about our field notebook. Um, as you can see, I was sketching everything that we saw. Um, I was drawing, like we had to draw out all of the organisms, not all of them, but most of them. And then um, we, we sketched diagrams and maps of all the places that we went. And we had almost like seven to 11 pages full for each stop, I think was what we were supposed to have. Um, and we wrote down our observations and our interpretations and just like had an overall record of our trip through our field notebook, which is really awesome to go back and look at everything that we saw. So next up is Watling's Castle and Watling's Blue Hole. So funny story, Watling's Castle was neither a castle nor was it owned by Watling. It's just named for him. Um, I looked him up. He was apparently a buccaneer, which is like a fancy word for pirate that <laughs> frequented the island. The island was actually named for him at one point, but obviously it's not named for him anymore. Watling's Castle is actually the ruins of an 18th century loyalist plantation. 
So we kind of took this opportunity to reflect on slavery on the island and the impact that that's had on the island's history. Um, and you can see it's kind of sitting on top of a little cliffside there. And of course, that's all limestone. You guessed it. <laughs> and then a little bit ways behind that cliff is Watling's Blue Hole. So Blue Hole is basically just a marine vertical cave that's open to the surface and you can get varying depths there. So that was really cool. So in the afternoon, um, we headed down to Sandy Point, which is the southernmost point on the island, um, and talked about longshore drift. This was literally the only photo that I found of it because we were only there for about an hour. Um, but you can see this was a uh, one spot that we saw like pretty big waves and felt the current moving us across the shore. And so, um, and you can see this wave right here. Um, uh, and it is hitting the beach at an angle. So you can visually see that it's moving to the northwest. Um, and we also, while we were snorkeling, we felt the waves moving us to the northwest. And that was um, really driven by uh, winds. And because San Salvador is kind of on the outskirts of the Bahamas, it gets affected by that um, or, or atmospheric circulation that happens in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, that they're like in the atmospheric patterns. Um, so that, that could be felt as we were being pushed in the Northwest. So our first stop on the next day of the trip was North Point, which is this cute little peninsula up here. It's very close to the field station. So North Point is really neat because you can really see the difference between the east and the west side of the peninsula. There's a lot of wind that comes from the east, which stirs up the water on the east side of the harbor. So you can see that the cliffs have been really cut into over here. As compared to the west side, where the water's very calm, there's not as much wind, and the cliffs are a lot more built up. So the main thing we wanted to figure out here was the paleo current, wind or water, that deposited these sands here. So by looking at it, we noticed that the sediment was very fine. And you can also see that there are these tree root casts. Right here is an example of one, which tells us that it was terrestrial. So we call this aeolonites, meaning deposited by wind. So um, that afternoon, I think, yeah, we went to Gollum's Reef, which uh, personally was my favorite spot um, on the trip. And kind of everyone was looking forward to Gollum's Reef because it was incredible. Um, but we had to take a boat out there from the field station. Um, and we hopped in the water and we saw an actual like coral reef that you see in like National Geographic documentaries. And it was, it blew, blew me away, but um, there was a lot of vertical growth. It was, I want to say probably like 15 feet tall and you could actually dive down and see the coral growing up above you. And um, we see these like vertical growth corals, um, the staghorn and the elk horn. Um, you can see some sea fans over here, um, some parrot fish down here, some parietes, uh, the coral over here. Um, and there's just a greater, like a huge diversity of coral and fish that we saw. Um, and we were kind of thinking about, um, is this reef healthier than snapshot reef? And I think that it's pretty easy to conclude that this is a lot healthier than Snapshot, which is the really sparse reef that we were uh, showing earlier in the slides. And we also took a moment to talk about um, what threats coral reefs are facing here. Um, the biggest one is coral bleaching, which happens when the coralline algae in uh, that have a uh, symbiotic relationship with the coral get stressed either by ocean temperatures or um, ocean acidification, or um, the chemicals that are in your sunscreen, why well, you should have reef safe sunscreen. Um, and you can see the bleaching happening here. Uh, the, the algae leaves the coral and leaves them very vulnerable to disease and ultimately will probably die. Um, and then another huge threat is hurricanes. Um, when those strong winds come and build up the waves, it knocks down the coral and actually like physically breaks the coral reefs. Uh, so on the way back from Gollum's Reef, we stopped at Green Key and saw the rare and endangered Bahamian iguanas. And this is actually the only island that they survive on still, because uh, there's no natural predators. It's basically just this, like, it's an island full of carts and all these, like, shrubby type plants. Um, and there are no humans, no stray dogs to endanger them. Um, and they were doing this like dominance ritual to try and get us off our uh, off the island. And they were like 
bobbing their heads. <laughs> Some of the students had a little um, face off with them. It was funny. <laughs> so our first stop on the next day of the trip was Storrs Lake, which is this little inland lake here that is not connected to the ocean. So Storrs Lake was incredibly exciting because it's only one of five places in the world today where you can see living stromatolites. <laughs> What's a stromatolite? Stromatolites are dome-shaped carbonate structures that are formed by microbes. So we get little cyanobacteria that do photosynthesis and they make little algal mats. And they also precipitate calcium carbonate, which combines to make this lovely, described by Linda and Rowan as crunchy mucus. <laughs> Can confirm that that's exactly what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. So why are we so excited about crunchy mucus? Well, I, I don't know. I think it's cool because they are some of the oldest living fossils or living fossils, oldest fossils that we have, like three and a half billion years old, some of the oldest fossils on the earth. And they were also major oxygenators of our atmosphere. So you can thank stromatolites for being here with us today. So why are the stromatolites so happy in Storrs Lake? Storrs Lake is really warm, which makes it hypersaline. And that's good because we get a lot of dissolved minerals that they can take up and precipitate back out into their structure. And it's also turbid, which means there's a lot of oxygen in the water, which also helps with precipitating calcium and carbonate. And there's also suspended sediment, which they can incorporate into their bodies and make them a little bulkier. But the main reason is that the lake is so incredibly salty that nothing else lives here. So there's nothing that lives here that eats them and they can be happy. So then that afternoon, we headed down to Pigeons Creek, um, which is down here on the map. Um, and it was really interesting to compare Pigeons Creek to Storrs Lake because Pigeons Creek is a tidal creek. And that is what Storrs Lake used to be um, until it got shut off from that freshwater influx um, and became hyper saline because there's no you know, fresh water coming in. Fresh as in not as salty as it is, but it's still coming from the ocean. Um, but Pigeons Creek might eventually end up that way if longshore drift um, cuts off the uh, access to fresh water. And so maybe eventually down the line, um, Pigeons Creek might house some stromatolites as well. But for now, it is fresh. It is or it's a much healthier habitat than Storrs Lake, um, where we talked about the mangroves. And you can see here that the mangroves in Pigeon Creek were basically serving as nurseries for all these baby fish. And we even saw a little tiny barracuda in the mangrove roots, which is pretty cool. Um, and their um, leaves also provide habitat for birds and stuff. Um, but comparing this to Storrs Lake, the mangroves at Storrs Lake were very barren um, and didn't house a lot of organisms, mostly because there were no other organisms in Storrs Lake. Um, and so here we also talked about ooids, which we can see up here. And they're basically tiny little grains of calcium carbonate that form um, when a nucleus, which is like a grain of sand, um, gets covered in um, calcium carbonate that again precipitates from the water. And it's a really great um, location to have ooids because it's high energy, which is aerating the water and again reacting with the um, dissolved carbonate um, that comes from the carbonate platform that they're on to form these ooids and they like grow outward like that into um, small little round balls. I think some someone saw ooids. I didn't personally saw the, see the ooids, but theoretically we saw them here. <laughs> so our next stop was Rado Beach. And this is another high energy beach where we see beach rock. So again, those high energy waves have a lot of dissolved oxygen, which as Selwyn just said, <laughs> helps with the precipitation of calcium carbonate and cementing those sand grains together. And this actually happens incredibly quickly in terms of geologic time. It's so fast that sometimes you can get things like Coke cans, or I saw like a modern conch shell, modernism unfossilized, um, <laughs> cemented into the rock. So that's pretty crazy. Um, and we also took this opportunity to look at the vegetation gradient from the water towards the land. Um, and here's another field notebook example of a vegetational cross section. Um, so from this, you can see that we have the short plants near the water because they're better equipped to resist the salt and the wind. And there's actually a dune towards the back that protects the taller plants so they can grow here too. Oh, and we made a quick stop to Monument Beach. 
Um, Columbus actually made landfall in San Salvador. This is the place where he made landfall in the New World. So there is a monument that commemorates that spot. Um, and it's also home to the 1958 Mexico Olympic plane, which is very large. <laughs> All right, so our last stop of the trip uh, was Bamboo Point, and this was our continental shelf day, and it was just north of the uh, snapshot reef that we were talking about earlier. Um, you can see where the continental shelf actually drops off, where this light blue water goes to the dark water. Um, and so this spot is where the continental shelf is closest to the island. And so I think it was about a fourth of a mile out offshore. And to get there, we had to swim over lots of sand flats. Um, we saw these little garden eels that um, would pop their heads out and then pop right back down when you uh, swam over them. Saw some feather duster worms down here um, that again, if, if you uh, like squish your hand, they'd flop or you know, pop back in their little tubes. Saw some skates um, and a barracuda. So this brings us to our final big picture question of for geology, which was comparing the bathymetry between San Salvador and a beach a little closer to home in Virginia Beach. Um, so San Salvador is on a carbonate platform and the drop off uh, is very close to shore. It's almost it's about like 250 meters out and it goes from about 30 meters and you and then you swim out another like few feet and then it drops down to almost like a kilometer or more. And so it's very, very abrupt. Whereas in Virginia Beach, um, there is a continental shelf, which is a very gradual dip of the um, ocean floor until you get to the continental slope and then it goes into the abyss like a thousand meters offshore. Um, and this is because of rivers. In San Salvador, there are no rivers bringing uh, sediment out to the coast. And so there's no deposition of sediment that builds out that continental shelf. We're in Virginia Beach. There are lots of rivers bringing out um, the course or the, co the sand and all the mineral and the sediment. Um, and so that brings us to talk about the uh, sand composition. In San Salvador, it's a lot of eroded uh, calcium carbonate um, that comes from the platforms and it's really soft and round and made up of coral shells and organisms, uh, which I touched on earlier. And then in Virginia Beach, it's coarse grained quartz sand that is brought by rivers from the inland mountains. And it is very high mineral concentration with that silt and clay that comes out. Um, and it has some shell, shell fragments, but definitely not as much as San Salvador. And that brings us to our final big picture biological question. We wanted to compare our three main marine habitats that we saw, coral reefs, seagrass beds, and sand flats. And we want to compare these in terms of their overall diversity. Uh, we have we use two main metrics to determine that. We have species richness, how many different species do we have? And then species evenness. Is one species more dominant than the others, or are they all roughly the same? So in terms of these metrics, coral reefs were by far the most diverse habitat that we saw. You get all sorts of things, of course, hard coral, soft coral, and then many different types and sizes of fish. Is actually pretty much the only place where we see the big fish present. So you get all those different trophic levels. And that's because coral reefs are unique from the other habitats in that they have that vertical structure and development. So there's places for those little fish to hide away from the predators. So they're more likely to be able to survive here. Next in terms of diversity is our seagrass beds. These have good species richness, but poor species evenness because the grasses are incredibly dominant. But this can actually be a good thing. The grass traps the sediment here so the beach doesn't just erode away. And it's also food for our little sea turtle friends. <laughs> you get things like spiny lobsters, live conch, and then this is an example of algae. This is a mermaid shaving brush algae, but there's other types as well. And then finally, we have our sand flats. Um, these are the least diverse just because there's poor species richness here. It's a little bit of a tough environment to survive in. There's you know, no cover, no shelter. So that makes you know things like our garden eels that can burrow in the sediment more likely to live here, but not most things. This, of course, is the playground of the stingrays. We saw so many out here. And then, of course, we have our echinoderm friends, sea stars, sea biscuits, and sand dollars. And that's it. We have a little video of our class waving to you. <laughs> now is the truck piled up with all of our luggage. Yep. <laughs> this is us leaving for the airport.
Questions? Yeah, all right. Um, so in one of the photos that Matt thought he um, said, like, <laughs> we'll get there. Here we go. <laughs> That is sand. So it was, it was a really weird structure of coral reef. It kind of grew in like in almost strips. I still don't know why that was happening, but um, there were little patches of sand in between it. And you can kind of see the beginning of one over here. They're anchors, guys. Oh, oh. Anchors. oh. oh. Interesting. Wow. I didn't realize that. So, oh, um, yeah, Orion was asking um, what these strips of white were and they are um anchor scars where the reef is not growing and it's just sand. Any other questions? Yeah. My um I just had one about the um the the stromatolites and their environment of the hyper salinity of sewer point. Yeah. Um so <laughs> <laughs> Is it only like one measurement of just like how warm a water, like how warm an environment is for hypersalinity, or are there other controls as well? Right. So Milo is wondering about how we quantify hypersalinity. Um, we actually took a conductivity probe out here, and you know how conductive the water is correlates with how many dissolved ions there are. So we were actually able to quantify it with the number. <laughs> Else? Oh gosh, <laughs> how do we get it to come back? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. okay. Oh, chat, please. Yeah, so Chloe Abara asks, why are, there, why are there some curved ridges, lakes on the island? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so we see that form. There's actually a really neat um, LIDAR map that's on the wall of the cafeteria. Um, but it's basically like the scars of old sand dunes that have now migrated inland that creates those like C shapes on the island. So we see that in the forms of the lakes and also in the like high points on the island, which is not very high, but <laughs> they are still C shaped. Yeah, so it's like old shorelines basically. Mm -hmm. All right, thank them again. <laughs> okay, so I just want to make a couple of announcements that uh, next Friday there will not be a brown bag because we're preparing for our um, field trip, our, our in the canoes is where we're going to go. So it's the geology uh, department field trip. The week after that will be Chuck Bailey, who's actually going to pre present. Do you remember that, Chuck? I do, Linda. Okay, well, I'm presenting a Great. So, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah.